So the webinar is has now started and we'll use five minutes to allow attendees to join. Hello everyone. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Uh, let me just check and make sure. Yeah. 
Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Sharda Ganga. Welcome to the first to this first activity in what WWF Guyana's hopes will become an on and offline platform for continuous dialogue on building sustainable and just economies in Suriname and Guyana. More on the why of this initiative will be presented shortly by WWF Director of the Guyanas, David Singh. Before we move to the real content of today, uh, let me give you some house rules or present you with some house rules. Um, first of all, as you can hear, uh, the webinar will be conducted in English. Um, if you wish to, uh, uh, if you do have a question and uh, would rather post that in Dutch, you can do that as well. And we'll try and translate as best as we can. Second uh, thing, uh, the webinar is streaming live on Facebook. It is also being recorded, just so you know. Um, I'm asking all panelists to please my, uh, put their mic on mute when not speaking. And to you participants and viewer, viewers, please post your questions and remarks in the Q&A box, which you can see on your screen. Please do not post them in the chat box because we won't be able to monitor both the Q&A box and the chat box. So questions and remarks in the Q&A box. Then keep in mind, please, that we have over 200 participants, probably over 300 participants. So we will most definitely, most definitely not be able to present all the questions you post to the panel. And I do apologize for that. The WWF team behind the scenes will gather the questions you post, and I will be I will be presenting a selection from these questions to the panel. Please keep your questions brief and clear, and let us know if possible for whom it is intended. Say, for example, a, a question for David Singh, and then your question. Make sure that we can see your name and affiliation if you post a question. As always, questions should regard the topic and with uh, an understanding that uh, the people in the panel uh, would be able to, to, to answer those questions. Um, so no questions for the president in this, in this forum. And last but not least, use the chat only for notes to the, okay, no, this, this, this I should not tell you because we're only using the Q&A box. Well, again, welcome. In this first seminar, we will focus on oil and gas. And the central question of today is, can fossil fuels help build a sustainable economy? We have three people uh, on the panel today. The first one um, is known both in Guyana and Suriname uh, by this time, uh, is David Singh. David Singh is WWF's representative in Suriname and Guyana. He has more than 20 years experience in natural resource management with a focus on governance and institutional development. He has engaged directly with all stakeholders in developing locally driven solutions to align their interests and to respond to national and international agreements such as climate change, such as on climate change, biodiversity, conservation, indigenous people's rights and the UN sustainable goals. The second speaker today will be Rudolf Elias. Uh, Mr. Elias has been with Stats Oli, the National Oil Company of Suriname, since 2009. He served as Director of Business Development, the Director of Refining and Marketing, and Director of the Refinery Expansion Program before becoming CAO and Managing Director in 2015. Before joining Stats Oli, he was the Vice President Development of BHP Billiton Suriname, and he worked at Balas Nedam International as general manager for Caribbean, Suriname, and Guyana. Um, and the third speaker will be Nicol Mr. Nicholas uh, Dago Boyer. Mr. Boyer is the chair of the Private Sector Commission in Guyana, which is the national body of all private sector associations and business entities in Guyana. He is also the president of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry as well as a director 
of National Hardware Guyana and Royal Castle Guyana. He is also a founder of Guyana Oil and Gas Support Services Incorporation. And I will now hand over the mic to David Singh, who will talk about threading the needle between brown and green economy. David, the mic is yours. Thank you, Sharda. And good evening to you in the audience. Uh, this evening, I am really pleased to share the stage with the chair of the Guyana's Private Sector Commission, Nicholas Boyer, and uh, the CEO of Statsoiler, Sir Nam's National Oil Company, Rudolf Elias. We are here to discuss with you the topic, building a sustainable economy. Can oil and gas exploitation contribute to green economies in the Guyanas? Of course, the topic begs the question whether our countries are still keen in, on pursuing green economies, which according to the UN is, is, is said to be a low carbon resource efficient, which includes environmentally responsible behavior and a socially inclusive uh, economy. When we refer to, normally when we refer to oceans and the marine environment, we speak about a blue economy. But for the sake of this conversation here, a green economy will include a blue economy. You know, five years ago, we would not have been asking this question that we have, we're asking ourselves this evening. Because a mere five years ago, there was no massive proven reserve in the Guyanas, proven oil reserve in the Guyanas. And our countries championed, truly championed, low carbon green economic development. We were going to build sustainable societies through leveraging incentives from the international community in return for saving our forests and our fresh water. We were also going to contribute to the global fight to mitigate climate change through conservation and sustainable management of our forest ecosystems. And of course, Guyana, Guyana had a deal with Norway on forests and climate and Suriname was really keen to win a similar relationship. But today we are faced with the stark choice between developing an oil-centered economy on one hand versus an economy that is less dependent on natural resources and more focused on the transformation of manufacturing, promotion of sustainable production of renewable resources from land and water, converting these to food, feedstock, materials and energy while growing new jobs and industries. This latter economy, as opposed to an oil-centered economy, is the base of a green economy. So the question again, can we still pursue green economies in the Guyanas? You know, this question is being asked with increasing frequency in our countries. And it does deserve an answer in a way that people can understand and assemble around. I believe it, it, it truly can be possible, but for oil and gas to contribute to low carbon and green economies, oil must be developed only as an important contributor and not the central pillar of economic development for the Guyanas. Our countries must remain resolute in building solid low carbon and green economies. We must ensure that the proceeds of oil are sustainably managed to trigger economic diversification. The revenues must be used to increase resource efficiency and address social inequities and divisions within our multi-ethnic societies through thoughtful investment. And the revenues must be used to enhance commitment to the rights of, its, of our citizens and to protect our very basic asset our natural heritage that has made us so proud for so many decades. I support building a green economy versus an oil-based economy. And this is against the backdrop of a number of factors. Firstly, fossil fuels are a non-renewable and a finite resource. Its extraction contributes directly to carbon production, which has a direct impact on the global climate crisis. I believe that countries that continue 
to center their economies around oil are on the wrong side of history. Not only will they be contributing to the climate crisis, but they also will be building their economies on an energy source, the future of which is not as certain as it was a decade or so ago. While there is still a long way to go before renewables become the principal source of energy, we should be building a long-term development path on assets that have a higher chance of appreciating in value. And we know that this, is, this includes assets such as our people, our forests, our fresh water, our biodiversity. Beyond this is, of course, the risks associated with a poorly regulated oil and gas uh, industry. But the task is not a simple one. The world is littered with examples of poor practice and misuse of the revenues from oil and gas. Oil spills have destroyed ecosystems and communities, and even the countries that are held up as good examples have their own challenges. So how do we thread the needle? of maintaining our focus on green economic development, while at the same time making use of the revenues of oil and gas and properly regulating the industry. It will require a collective effort. Governments, business, and the civil, and civil society, society, including academia, must unite around a common future built on a common set of values while we, while we respect the interests of others. Together, we must unite in the common purpose of growing strong governance and institutional structures, fostering an energized civil society, entrenching and respecting a free press and growing a vibrant and innovative academic environment. If we don't invest in these things, our societies, in my opinion, will fall apart and become easy pickings for others whose interests are not coincident with ours as independent nation state. This evening's initiative is one contribution to this process. We hope that what we are starting here will grow into a true dialogue that contributes meaningfully towards a green and just future for us in the Guyanas. Dialogues are meant to help to break down those things that divide us and build connections outside of our traditional relationships. They encourage new pathways to grow respect and collaboration, and they are geared to develop sustainable approaches to our challenges in a fair and democratic manner. We focus in the region, particularly Suriname and Guyana, because of our similarities, the lessons that we can learn from each other, and the cross-fertilization that can enrich us, and the collaboration that can increase economies of scale. Colleagues, the last five years have seen dramatic changes. This year is a case in point. What will the next five years bring us? And how much of this can we control? I would like to end with five very specific proposals. Firstly, let us work hard on harnessing a set of values, a sort of renewal of our national mottos and those things which fill us with national pride and which guide us over this period. These values should outlast political change and form the basis on which we build accountability in this critical period as we face the future. Secondly, let, let us focus on building the institutional capacity to regulate the oil and gas sector in both countries. This should include an urgent review of the programs at the universities to include training and research into regulation of the sector. Thirdly, let us debate how the oil and gas sector can effectively and truly contribute to the sustainable development agendas for Guyana and Suriname over and beyond their standard responsibilities that would apply to any other country, and also beyond the corporate social responsibility that is expected of any sector operating anywhere in the world. Fourthly, 
let us work on the development and implementation of strong environmental and social safeguards for the industry. And fifthly, and very importantly, let us support our state institutions tasked with the regulation of the sector and call for, their, for more support so that they can be better equipped. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David. That was actually on the dot within the time limit. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, let's uh, immediately go to the next speaker, which is um, Mr. Elias. Uh, Mr. Elias, uh, Rudolf Elias, who's going to talk about how to turn black gold green. I should start on muting and then uh, there will be a, 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 a small movie of introducing Suriname, who we are, uh, because I think that it is important also to understand that. Uh, it is maybe also nice to understand why I am here because the, the, the in, in one, I feel a lot, uh, I have a lot of passion for the environment. Let that be very clear. Uh, I've, I've grew up in Suriname and, and, and Suriname and Guyana have really one of the nicest biodiversity in the world and we should keep it that way. Uh, can, can we start the movie and then uh, let me do my... Yes. Mm. Nami. 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 Yes, it is. I mean, it is of course extremely nice to see a movie like that, and 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 we should understand that. I mean, the forest was there, and the biodiversity was there already for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and like the biodiversity, also the oil was there for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Suriname is at the edge of a big change because the only the three finds that we have at this moment and we are drilling of course like like i mean like guyana is drilling and and i can remember the first discussions that i had with the minister of uh, of natural resources in guyana when he said he had the fourth find he said if i we have the fifth i will maybe get a heart attack and it is the same also for suriname because every time you have a new find you know that there is a new challenge and we will have a lot of challenges coming. With these three fines alone, the government of Suriname will get an income anywhere between 20 and $60 billion and $20 billion is the lowest possible income if we uh, develop all three uh, of, of the, the fines that we have, of the discoveries. And it is based on a low oil price and it is based on a low extraction. And the 60 billion is based on a $55 uh, oil price and, and, and a higher extraction. At this moment, we are dwelling a fourth well. Exxon and, 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 and Petronas are dwelling uh, a well also in the same golden lane of oil. And we can expect other finds there. 
Also, Tello will drill a well early 2021, and Shell, which was uh, is, is, is a little bit above uh, block 58, will drill a well in, uh, in block 42, which is also in that golden lane of our... So if you look at Suriname and, 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 and the deals that we made, of course, with the oil companies, because we have a long history of oil, we had started only as the national oil company. We have a very strong regulation on the oil with starts only as the na national oil company. We will extract the 20 to $60 billion and it will come into, into the economy. And we have ourselves a lot of questions to ask. And if we can go to the next slide. Can, can you go to the next slide? Yes. Uh, the questions that we have to ask is how will we be able to take that money that we will make with, with the oil and bring it into eternity? Because no matter how you look at it, our biodiversity and the way that we look at our biodiversity and the biodiversity of uh, Guyana, it's something that will be there for eternity. It will be there forever. But we have to take care of it now, you know, because now we are the greenest country. And I think that Ghana is also in the top 10 of greenest countries in the world. If now we take some of that money, not all, I mean, it doesn't take a lot of money in order to preserve the things that we have. If we stop the logging and just pay off the people that uh, that are logging uh, at this moment with the money that we will make. We have so many challenges that we have to look forward because no matter what you do and no matter how you look at it, the wealth of the natural resources, the oil is like the bauxite and we know that by now in Suriname it's ending. One day it will be over. I can guarantee you that if we preserve the, 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 the biodiversity that we have today, we will have it in 50 years, but we will also have it in a hundred years and a thousand years from now. So it will also be there for our children and our grand, grand, grandchildren if we do the right things at the moment. And it is of course, we as the leaders that can talk about it, but it is especially the behavior of our people that will in the end decide whether we will go the Norway way. I always say that because all the money that we will make, will that go, will we be able to make that the Norway uh, system or will we go the way that Venezuela went uh, and, 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 and other countries like Ecuador and Algerie went? What are the typical challenges that we have? And I always say, let's, have a national discussion today where all the politicians, coalition and opposition, but also the business society and the unions come together and they say, what will we do with the money that we will get five years from now? Let's discuss it today. Because if we don't discuss it today, by default, we will not have anything yet to discuss and we will not have anything to spend it on. And when you don't have that, it is very easy to go the way that Venezuela went. So I think that turning the black gold into green is something that we have to do for our children's children and, and, and for the future generations. Uh, we will have the money in order to do that. We will have all the opportunities to do that. But it is the behavior in the end of the people that will drive that. And the behavior of the people will be driven by the politicians in order to come together and say, let's have that national discussion of what we will do with the 20 to $60 billion that we will get in the coming 30 years. These are the three fines if we will develop them, but maybe the 20 to 60 billion will be 10 times bigger or 15 times bigger, we don't know. But let's have that discussion today in order to understand a lot better what our future will be. And when I talk to about our future, it's not the future of me or the future of David or the 
future of child mobility, especially the future of the children's children that will be able to prosper from the things that we do today. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Rudolf. Um, I hope there are some of the politicians uh, watching you and us. Um, and uh, before I give the uh, mic to uh, Mr. Boyer, please audience, uh, people in the audience, um, do not raise your hand, but post your question in the Q&A. Um, because we're gathering, for those who, who came in late, we're gathering the, uh, you can put your questions in the Q&A and we're gathering the questions and uh, we will present a selection of those questions to the panelists after uh, the last present, well, after the panel discussion. So don't raise hands, put it in writing. And I give the floor to uh, Mr. Boyer. Thank you, Sharda. Uh, let me say good evening to everyone watching. So just a quick housekeeping item. Uh, am I going to share my screen or will you load my presentation for me, uh, Kim? Kim, uh, can you share? I think it's... Kim, will you share or should Mr. Boyer share? I tell you what, I'll, I'll go ahead and share. I have it loaded. Yes, go ahead and share. Please share screen. One second. All right. So, good evening to viewers, good evening to fellow panelists. So, I'm going to, you know, right on top of what all the other speakers spoke because. David did a very good job of outlining the challenges ahead of us. And he also had in there a subtle reference to Guyana's low carbon development strategy. Uh, Rudolph talked a lot about the challenges where we want to mono sorry, monetize the oil, but we want to remain green. And how we do that is, is kind of the crux of tonight's conversation. So first of all, I, I, just a little bit of a geography lesson. The Guyana Shield is the piece of rock that we all live on, that I live on, that's part of Venezuela, that's part of Suriname, and it's the beautiful geology that goes along with it that brings the biodiversity and the oil. Uh, in fact, I think we in, in the English-speaking Guyana share with Brazil and Suriname one of the oldest uh, tabletop mountains in the world, Mount Roraima, which is in all three countries at once. Now, the key challenges to the sustainable development that we have ahead of us, and I want to define sustainable development. Sustainable development, that, as I'm going to speak about it tonight, I will outline two major principles. The first is that it should be based on a let's say a production level or, or composition of GDP, where you are not just dependent on finite resources. So a large percentage of your GDP is not just beholden to the extraction of finite resources. And across the Guyanas, we can talk about gold, bauxite, and now oil. Secondly, sustainable development, as I will talk about it tonight, will center around uh, not destroying the environment, the pristine environment that we have across the Guyanas. And so that's why one of the two photos I have here, both starts with the you know, capture of, of downtown Georgetown, where we have a mix of historical buildings and new buildings, where the development, the spin-off development from the oil industry is increasing the commercial and residential development, pushing the, the expansion of the city and replacing green areas with more, with more concrete. That's a challenge. Secondly, one of the famous things that has happened recently is that when Exxon started production, they had to start flaring unexpectedly and the volume of flaring was quite significant. Therefore, our carbon emissions as a country increased significantly. So these are two major challenges going ahead that oil is 
a dirty environment, uh, sorry, a, a, a dirty business. It is naturally, you know, by, it is going to generate a certain amount of carbon emissions to lift that oil out of ground, worse yet when you're flaring. Keys to mitigating this, knowing that we are going to be leveraging this, this industry to create more sustainable routes to growing our GDP is going to be several factors. One of the factors is local content. And the other factor is going to be new paradigms. So we started with a low carbon development strategy that our government had proposed in about 2011. And the idea was a, a cap and trade mechanism where we would basically continue to preserve our forests as carbon capture and then sell the, the carbon offsets to other developed countries who needed carbon offsets. Now, why are these things important? Is that, you know, going forward, how are we going to build a sustainable economy? It means that we have to spend the funds coming in from the oil offshore and spend it in a way that unlocks infrastructure and the power of our human capital. Because I really believe that we have solid entrepreneurs behind us and that once we give them the right tools, and so if you think about infrastructure and infrastructure here is roads, potable water, electricity, and now more so ICT, the ability to access data at, at necessary speeds because business now even more so during the pandemic is also going you know, online. So being able to have that capable infrastructure will allow our entrepreneurs to find new avenues of doing more sustainable business, whether it is agro processing and finding export markets to take that agro process, you know, take the agriculture, move it through agro processing lines, and then export it out, creating larger industries than we had before. In Guyana, we, one of our biggest challenges to the growth of agro-processing was the cost of energy. And so, for instance, one of the projects that has been talked about in India infrastructure was bringing the gas that is there offshore onshore. Now, natural gas is a finite resource. Uh, what you're seeing here is a picture of the Myla Falls project, and I'll get to that. Natural gas is a final, finite resource, but it still is cleaner burning than what we are currently doing. We generate all of our power in Guyana based off of heavy fuel oil with a few light fuel oil generators. And it's incredibly dirty. So for us, if just even this one project comes from the oil industry, it would lower our power costs. It would open up downstream activities and it would reduce our emissions that we are currently putting out to generate electricity. And so that, that in itself is a paradigm for how the oil industry, a very dirty industry, can still unlock potential in downstream industries and open up sectors that we didn't think were there. And eventually as those sectors grow, larger projects such as the Myla Falls, which is a completely you know, renewable uh, generation type of project, will then move from being kind of thought of as a white elephant type of project or a major infrastructure project that was beyond reach of the country as the GDP grows and the percentage of you know, government spending or government's budget that this project would represent will start to come down in size, as well as with local content you have an increase in the technical capacity in the persons who are, who are working. Now, in Guyana, we've had a challenge where a lot of our curriculums and a lot of the persons we are putting out into our industries are not up to scratch when you come to industries that are heavily regulated, such as oil and gas. It's not an insurmountable problem, but we need to retool the educational industries and we need local content to drive that expansion. Uh, I know a lot of persons are worried about the resource curse, which some people call Dutch disease, which is the basic over-reliance 
on an industry like the oil industry, which is an extractive and finite industry to generate most of the revenues. And we only need to look to our, rev our, our neighbor in the West, in Venezuela, to understand what happens. Venezuela's oil production dipped below a million barrels per day. And when you look at it, they, they have solely become reliant on an oil industry and that oil industry is crashing, creating such a negative situation in the country. There are a lot of factors we can use to point to it, political and others, but the key is that their whole economy is based off of oil, even though they have as much resources as we do for agriculture and for other, other type of uh, productive activities. But the key here, why local content is important to Guyana, it is to transform the industrial capacity of the country. But the beauty of the beautiful thing that will limit the spread of Dutch disease is that our oil is offshore. Off, the offshore oil industry is not labor intensive. It's completely different to the onshore oil industry, which is far more labor intensive. And as a result of that, there will be a limited number of jobs available for persons working in the offshore oil industry. So it will not be able to take off the number of persons that we will, if we retool our education system, that will be produced by a retool education system. Therefore, other sectors are going to have to grow to take off those persons. So for instance, mining, although mining is still finite, but agriculture, as well as manufacturing. So with that, I will leave more discussions for the, the Q&A period. Thank you, uh, Mr. Boyer, uh, Mr. Elias, and uh, David. Mr. Singh, uh, he's very happy that I've now called him Mr. Singh, probably the first time ever. So, uh, before we jump into the questions, because we have by now over 35 questions, I think, um, let me just give the floor to you three, and I'll start with David and ask him, is there anything in the uh, presentations uh, from the other panelists that you would comment on or that you would react to or questions that you have for each other? And I'll uh, first, David, then Rudolph, and then, um, uh, can I say Nicholas? Yes, because I've seen you now for the third time. David. Thanks, Charlie. You know, um, I've, uh, it, it's, you know, I, I'm always surprised when I engage in things like this to rec recognize the, the extent to which we have so many ideas which are similar to each other. So the level of conflict that we assume in our sound chambers, but we exist in our own land networks and we assume things of people who are not within our network um, is, 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 I believe it's a, a, a thing that we really have to be mindful of and work hard um, to, 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 to engage with each other. And that I believe is the purpose of this dialogue. So I want to emphasize that that's one thing that really struck me um, a lot, and to recognize that um, you know they're, 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 I see lots of um, interest, very interesting questions from some amazing people who um, I deeply respect, and just to acknowledge that we may not be able to cover them all. So, okay, thank you, David. Um, Rudolf, a quick word, a quick reaction to the rest. Uh, I, I, I don't want to have a quick reaction to the rest. I just want to have what a little bit more room for all the questions that have been asked, because I also see a lot of the questions. And, and I think that uh, what David says is we have a lot of similarities. And, and, and let's try to answer as much questions as possible. OK, we'll do that. Uh, Nicholas? You I feel the same as, as, as Rudolf. I, I think uh, you, you have quite a number of questions there, and uh, I, I think we, we, we should spend the time on that. Okay, very, very good. Um, I'll start off with some questions that have been, that are not in the Q&A box, but were submitted before. Uh, and I'll start off with, um, let me see. Um, 
with a question that was that was sent to us by Lisa Best. Uh, Lisa works for Tropobus, uh, I think, still still works for Tropobus. And uh, some of you touched a bit on this subject. Uh, Lisa's question is: There's a lot of talk about green growth and green economy. What will determine what this looks like? What do you think should be the priorities to arrive at such a vision to work towards and ultimately decide the role of oil and gas sector? And David, for example, has talked about process to come to that vision, to come to that, what is it? But Lisa actually, actually asks, but how? Uh, what will determine what it looks like? Who would like to answer that? David, let's let's start with you. Well, I, you know, that's a great question, Lisa. I think um, there are many examples around the world of what people hold up as being great examples of a green economy. And then when you look behind all of those great examples, and some of them are at the country level, um, you realize that they have their own challenges. So my response to you, Lisa, is um, really recognizing that the, the balance in the green economy has to be between making, it, making sure that we are people-centered, that we develop something that's uniquely from our countries, from the region, understanding deep respect, respect for people, a deep, deep respect for natural patrimony, and an understanding that we have to grow on this, on, in this part of the world together and work from there and develop it. I mean, I could have given you all sorts of definitions of what a green economy looks like, but it's really us to design. We can be the beacon of hope to this world, showing the world what's really possible. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, can, I, can I add on that, Sharna? Am I allowed? Sorry. Yes, please. I was muted. Go ahead. Yeah. Rudolf. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you very much, David, for that, uh, that expression. It is always, it is very easy, uh, I always say, to look at the leaders and to say, what, uh, what will be the answer to, and, and, and where shall we go? But I also think that a lot and a lot of the, the, the questions that you ask also come from within you, yourself. Uh, I think that in the end, we should, give, uh, we should give a direction. We should give a street that we want to walk into. But in the end, it is the people, the behavior of the people that will decide how we will end that street in the end. So if you think about the green economy and you think about how will we spend the oil money in order to get where we would like to be, most probably my thoughts will be completely different as yours. Mm. But in the end, it is the behavior of the combined people that will lead us to the road in order to get that green economy that we all dream about. Because I don't think that in the end, if we sit together, that we will be so much different in that feeling. But yeah. we should listen to each other and say, okay, this is the road that we are going to walk and, 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 and let's all do it and, and let's all support it. Because it is the support that, that will in the end drive the behavior. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Nicholas, you, you want to add to that? No, I, I think uh, both, both uh, answers have been, been very good. I mean, the key is that we get together as a people and we have to decide on that. Okay. Okay. So the next question, uh, I'll, direct it, it, I'll direct to you, Nicholas, because you are the one who, who mentioned, um, you know, the Dutch disease. And this is a question from Dimitri Chonsifat, who I know uh, has been studying Dutch, the Dutch disease and the resource curse and all those things, and has been vigilant in explaining them 
to uh, a lot of people. His question was, um, how will the private sector help to mitigate the effects of the resource curse and specifically the Dutch, uh, and specifically Dutch DCs if the future foreign exchange earnings and spin-offs in the small national economies are drivers of Dutch DCs? Right. So the key thing is the, the first and, and, and the politically correct answer is policy, right? So the key is that the private sector has to lobby for policies that will be beneficial. Uh, for instance, I am one of the, the, let's say, the anarchist type thinking where I don't believe that our countries should allow the exchange rate to appreciate versus you know, international currencies such as the US dollar when our earnings of US dollars start to go up. The, the thing is, is that you're going to have a number of different economic policies that we need to implement to ensure that as our as oil production grows, we grow other sustainable parts of the economy that allow, as I said, we will have an offshore oil industry. It is going to be a very small footprint in terms of labor. It is definitely going to bring a large share of revenues, but other than those two impacts and, and revenues in, in, foreign, in foreign currency, there's going to be very little else that it directly does for our country. The rest of it is indirect. And we need to manage the, the addiction to just, you know, and key policies like this include a sovereign wealth fund, how the money that is taken from offshore goes into a sovereign wealth fund, and is then spent across other parts of the economy to unlock the other sectors. And that's, it, it, it is policies such as that, that we need to use to prevent the, 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 the Dutch disease. So it is something that a private sector has to get together and has to use the, the formal groupings that it has. I, I know that the Chamber of Commerce in Suriname is very strong. Uh, Private Sector Commission and Chamber of Commerce is in Guyana are very strong as well. And we have to be there with the government, working and critiquing the policies that they are putting in so that the policies they put in unlock the potential of other sectors in the economy and are not just beholden to only oil. That's the key. Okay. Um, I see Rudolf. Um, I, I have the feeling that Rudolf wants to say something. Rudolf, go ahead. Yeah, I think that Nicholas is completely right there. I mean, it's one of the most important things is that we should manage expectations of, uh, of, of, the, of local content. Uh, local content it is ex especially the stream of money that will come into the government that will drive completely different economies as the oil uh, industry itself. Everybody is now focused on, so what is the local content of the oil fine that we have, of the billions of dollars that they will spend offshore? It is especially the billions of dollars that will move into the government in the 20 years to come that we will have to spend wisely, not only in a sovereign welfare fund, but also that part that we will consume, that we say, on what will we consume it? I always say we have to go to this broader social discussion where you have coalition, opposition, the business society and the unions together in order to see what we will do, where we will spend the money on. Because especially the consumable part of the money is very important. If we don't do that well, and we don't say today that we will spend so much on healthcare, so much on infrastructure, we will spend so much on education, then when the money flows in on a certain moment, you will not have the projects anymore to do. So you, when you know where the money go, goes, you have to strengthen the institutions. And when you strengthen the institutions and you know that the money will flow in there for years and years to come, you will spend the money wisely. So the local content thing is more 
about the money that will flow into the government as from the oil industry itself, because we have such small economies. If you look at Guyana and Suriname, I mean, we have together, we have 1.3 million people. Uh, we have maybe 200,000, 300,000 of, uh, of families that work, you know, people that, that actually work. And a lot of them are in government still. So we, our pool of workers are so small. Okay. We really have to do this and we have to plan it well. If we don't plan it well, the first thing that will happen is exactly what Nicholas said, is the, is the Dutch disease. Yeah. Thank, Sorry that thank, I've been so long. Thank, thank, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, David. I, I, um, this is not a place or time because if I wanted to be real difficult, I could ask questions like, but what do you mean by the behavior of the people? Who are the people? And we will, and who, who is the we? But I won't be difficult today. So I'll give the floor to David. David, anything you want to add? No, just uh, yeah. I, I I want I want to, even as we we gather here in this fairly large space. I I want to emphasize um, what where do we go from here? Uh, you know, Esther's question really resounded with me. I mean, uh, her question was, "What do I do?" Exactly. And I think that's so important. What do I do, um, or how do I get involved? And I think it's a question we all have to ask ourselves. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll move to the next one, uh, which is uh, a question from Derek Curry. And um, let's try not to be politically correct. Um, Derek Curry asks, what are the most important policies and governmental organization structures that need to be in place to manage the process of transformation? So actually it builds upon the previous questions, but we're diving deeper in trying to pinpoint. So it's not just we have to, things have to change, but what, what policies, what organizational, what government organization structures? Suriname and Guyana. Hmm. Who wants to start? I, I can kick it off. So yeah, please do. one of the key things that, that we did is we put in a sovereign wealth fund and we have some political back and forth about the structure of the sovereign wealth fund. But the key is that let, let's talk about two things. First, you have actual regulation of the industry itself. And mm -hmm. so you need structures in place to monitor and manage the acreage, the production and the regulation of the industry, you know, its pollution, et cetera. Then you have to have the structures in place to manage the funds coming in. Like I said before, in the out, outset, we put in a sovereign wealth fund. Well, that's one piece of it because what's going to happen is funds are going to come into this mechanism. It could be a separate account. It could be a commingled account because in Guyana, technically we have one account for all government revenues coming in, uh, but the sovereign wealth fund changes that and creates a separate account. But the key is that you have to have for us from here on, you have to have clear, intelligible, and understood policy. Because in, in this, as, as Rudolph would have outlined, you have an intergenerational component, right? You are lifting oil that belongs not just to this generation, but all generations forward. And how much are you going to save and how much are you going to spend? So that's your first split. And so when you've decided how much you are saving and all of this should be well understood and well bought into by the people of the country, the next step is what are your development priorities? And then the money that you're about to spend should now be allocated to your development priorities as agreed to by the people, by the people of the country. So if your development priority is healthcare, you want a hundred thousand more hospitals. Well, the people agree that look, we want 100,000 more hospitals. And now you talk about the procurement systems because in our societies, uh, clear and transparent procurement by government is not always a given thing. So you now need your government procurement to be very transparent so that persons can understand 
that the government got the best return on investment for the dollars it spent on building that 100,000 hospitals. So essentially, if you look at it, how it moved through, first from a sovereign wealth fund, then into you know, which parts you're saving and spending, and then you had policy which dictated how you were spending, and then you had transparent institutions which dictated the procurement that actually then executed that spending. And so that's, that's what we as business and civil society need to continue to lobby for. Okay, Dave, if you want to add, because this was quite clear, but- That's, sure. that's clear, that's good. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, I'll just give me a second. I need to look for uh, the next question. Um, I, had a, I have a bunch of questions here. Um, ba -ba -ba. Let me see. Um, Fergus McKay, who is from the Forest People Program. Um, okay, I'll just read. Uh, I haven't read this, so excuse me if this doesn't come off um, fluently. Fergus McKay, Senior Counsel of the Forest People Program says, according to the World Bank, there are three, there are three main enabling conditions for extractive industries. Uh, to contribute to poverty alleviation, a pro-poor public and corporate governance through uh, sustainable development, respect for human rights, uh, including indigenous rights, and effective social and environmental laws, policies, and safeguards, which is actually ties into what you just discussed, Nicholas. Uh, it seems both countries fall short, obviously. Suriname still has no framework environmental law, not True, we have one since David helped me out. The framework environmental March, March of this year. March, March of this year, yeah. Um, we were there. Uh, it seems okay. Uh, no indigenous people's rights, correct. And Guyana continues to allow miners to destroy major river systems. Let me add to that, Suriname as well. Where should the governments of Suriname and Guyana start? Ah, okay. None of you is part of the government. So speaking clearly, speaking uh, from the heart, where should yeah. we start, David? I, 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 again, I, I want to jump into that. Uh, yeah. Go even ahead. though, yes, we are not, uh, of course, full government, uh, but it is, again, behavior of people. And it is especially people like uh, Ferguson McKay, who should assist us in, 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 in especially with, the, with, the, with, with our tribal and, and indigenous people, in order to assist us in not mining rivers and mining uh, the, the, our pristine jungle in the way that we are doing, but to do it a lot more uh, planned. And, and it is behavior of our people in the beginning that will lead to a better understanding of that. Uh, I know that Mr. McKay is an, 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 an international lawyer uh, of, of these things. And I think that it is extremely important that we start understanding a lot better as people of Suriname that uh, we have rights and, and that people cannot just go into our jungle and destroy it uh, without it being planned properly. Uh, okay. The indigenous people have right, the tribal people have right, but also we as, as, as normal people of Suriname have the right to, to stand up against that. Okay. Um, David? Well, you know, it's um, Fergus. Your question is 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 not an easy one uh, at all. I've um, oh, since I started to live in Suriname, I've been trying to understand a little bit more of Suriname's history. Um, it's pre-colonial um, through its post-colonial history, and of course, I'm familiar with Guyana. And one of the things that's really striking for me is that the car how special, how unique the Caribbean is 
that um, when uh, when we um, uh, when we we were basically given the reins of our countries to run, we were displaced people. We were brought here against our will, our four parents, and we were asked to rule and to take control of our countries. Uh, so I think we have to understand the, 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 the historical context in which we operate, even as we address the very fundamental issues of rights of people. And as you've emphasized the rights of, of indigenous and local people, um, and to understand where, uh, where do our countries go, where do our governments go, um, as we try to, to deal with incredibly complex issues um, that, 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 are, that, that we, we have more or less inherited um, and we work within. Mm. Okay. Uh, Nicholas, you want to add something? I would say, I think uh, the key is that we have to start with the end in mind. We have to have targets and how much mining we want, how much deforestation we want. And then we need to also have, you know, protections for our indigenous populations and then work from there to, to create the policies that allow for exploitation. Because mm -hmm. to, in, in Guyana, at least, the indigenous population obviously sorry, usually find a, most of their employment in some of these extractive industries such as logging and mining. So it's, it's not an easy one size fits all answer because if you shut down those activities, you shut down employment in some of those indigenous communities. So you mm. need to have consultations and, and an understanding of what drives the communities but we need to also have kind of desired goals. Are we going to preserve 56% of our forest as pristine? Are we going to preserve 76% of our forest as pristine? And which areas we're going to allow mining and, and, and foresting? Yeah, well, I'll stay with you, Nicholas, because I see a question coming in from Patrick Williams, who's asking, uh, what vision does the private sector com uh, commission have in assisting Guyana to transition into a green economy, uh, given the numerous challenges the sector poses with oil spills, expenditure on exotic projects, uh, corruption, et cetera. And, and please explain to me what is meant by exotic projects. Well, the thing is going back to like the Amila Falls, you, you're gonna have these large projects that our, custom, our country was not accustomed to executing before. And uh, people are going to have concerns about whether we can execute the construction of such a large infrastructure project. Uh, the key to it is the Private Sector Commission's view on our green development would be that we want to see infrastructural growth that opens up lands for development, but with certain targets in mind to understand which areas are going to be protected. For instance, we have the Iwakurama uh, forest area, which is protected. Mm -hmm and which areas are we are going to use, for instance, for ecotourism, so that there is an understanding that they're protected areas, but there's also an understanding that unfortunately there will be development, there will be deforestation, there will be spread of concrete and urbanization. So managing those targets is what's going to be key. And that's what the Private Sector Commission is interested in. And we expect that for the urbanization and the infrastructure development, we will start to unlock renewable sectors of our economies, uh, agro-processing being kind of okay. the, the standard. Okay. Okay. That, um, I don't know, David or, or Rudolf who wants to add something from the Suriname perspective or David from both, of course, although this was specifically geared towards the private sector uh, commission. I'm, I'm good. Okay, good. Okay, Saeed Hamid. Um, Sami, this is a question from uh, Saeed Hamid. How do we ensure better dialogue between proponents and lobbyists of the green economy and the political agents and recognizing the private sector is a relevant stakeholder in this regard? How does it then deconstruct the preconceived notion that the private sector may be more economic oriented 
and not necessarily green oriented. How do we guarantee this nexus? Yeah, can I, I yeah. I, I, you know, one of the things, uh, good question, Said. I, you know, one of the things you probably were wondering why it is I'm not using the terms that, um, such as protected areas, such as Forest 93 in Suriname, and that kind of thing. Well, the reason why I haven't had needed to do that is because the chair of the Private Sector Commission in Guyana is talking about conservation. And the CEO of Stats Oil is talking about conserving Suriname's uh, rainforest. So I think, you know, it, again, uh, there we have so many, so much going for us. We have, um, we start off by understanding where the other, the so-called other side is coming from. And if we do that, then we have a, 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 a the basis from which we can move forward. So I think it's it's. In my view, it's it's understanding the interests of people. Clearly, from what um, what Nicholas has been to saying, for instance, um, is perhaps uh, from a cons from us in the conservation side, we oftentimes um, may um, uh, may start off by assuming that the private sector is only driven by the immediate cash. You know the earning that you could get today rather than tomorrow um so and perhaps the private sector the business feels that conservationists all we want to do is to simply um keep keep the keep everything out keep nature absolutely pristine um perhaps we're not so far apart from each other after all yeah i i yeah. If I can add on that, uh, it is short-term thinking uh, compared to long-term thinking. And even though I, I am, I am, I, don't get me wrong. Normally, uh, politicians are short-term thinking because they think about the next election, and business people should be long-term thinking. In the in the whole philosophy of a, of the green and to preserve the biodiversity, it is something that you have to think long-term because long-term, I think that we will earn an awful lot of more money with the biodiversity that we have as the oil that we have, for example, in, uh, in, in, in the ocean. And, and when I talk about behavior, it is especially also the long-term education of our young people that the green economy in the end is one of our natural resources that will be there forever. It's not like the extractable uh, resources. The extractable resources are, are ending. They all have a beginning and they all have an end. Mm -hmm. Our biodiversity is endless. And, and, and it is endless, a, a worth an awful lot of money in the long term. And I think that also the business society should start understanding that. And that's, and it's all about education. It's all about how can we explain to our young people and to our young entrepreneurs that in the end, in the long term, it's about the money and, 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 our biodiversity is worth a lot more, most probably, than the oil that is there now uh, in the golden lane of oil from the Guyanas. In, in the what, the golden? The golden lane, you know, all where, where you go to Lisa and you yeah. drill all the wells that you drilled, and now they are continuing in Suriname. It's, it's what they call the golden lane of oil. Everywhere where you drill in that lane, you find oil. Wow, I've, I've learned something new today, the golden lane. So, yeah. Um, Nicholas, you want to add to this? I, Vera, I, I think uh, D David and, 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 and Rudolph have, have captured it succinctly. The only thing I would add is that, you know, Exxon, for instance, have said they, the resources they see out there they will deplete it within 40 years, given the, the production levels they want to achieve. So there's no bones that this is not an, an infinite industry. 
Uh, we may be lucky that technology changes and, and they're, they're, they're able to recover more barrels that, than they initially expected. But even if it hasn't happened, and outside of that, you, know, you have a lot of concepts we haven't even delved into, for instance, like peak oil demand. And you're seeing now, you're going to see a slight change. For instance, you're seeing electric cars become more acceptable. They still are not widely accepted as you'd, you'd expect them to be but slowly they're sliding in. So it, it brings to mind, will oil be with, you know, the, the in demand as it is over the next 30 or 40 years? And we don't know. So we cannot have a future that is just solely dependent on it. We have to make other investments because we have to be diversified in case technology changes on us. And, yeah. and you're, finding a lot of, you're finding a lot of recoverable resources. You, you put it in context, Venezuela sits on 300 billion barrels of proven resource, 300 billion. So there's definitely not a shortage of oil. So what we have to do is while it is hot and while we are getting the investment in, use that and really start to unlock other sectors. Yeah. Well, if I may step off my uh, uh, role as moderator and just uh, be a participant for a second. I think a lot of us from the other side, what what it all always boils down to is that, of course, um, these are uh, with our with our conscious mind uh, thinking logically. We we do not disagree. However, um, we've been here before. We've been here with bauxite. We've been here with gold. And each time we again uh, reinforce and 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 take off the and and uh, dust off uh, all these all these ideas of diversify the economies and and use the income in uh, in in such a way that etc cetera, etc. Cetera. We've been here before, so I think moving forward with the green uh, dialogue. I think what, what is on everybody's mind is how do we not fall into the same trap? So um, I apologize for stepping off my role as moderator. And uh, hopefully uh, I, I try to summarize what a lot of people are saying and, and, and thinking. So um, apologies to the panelists and apologies to the um, well, to the viewers, and I'll just go back to the rest of the questions, if you don't mind, or if anybody wants to say anything to me. David? Yeah, I, I, we're in a, uh, where we are in this period of our histories is very different charter from where we were back in those days. We are four to 50 years independ since independence. Yes. We do have substantial challenges, but when you think about um, about where we are as a people, uh, we we understand today much more what is needed because of when we look around the world and we see examples of we we have so many lessons from all around the world, and we also recognize that we are at this this pivotal point of our history. We, are no long, we no longer can speak about the potential of the Guyanas. We are at that point, we are at the crossroad, going either one way or the other way. So it's, in my view, this is what, where, we, where we are today and where we are, where we are in the world. This is a permanent, the decision we make will be permanent. Okay. And we, I believe we have the tools to make it different. If we embrace that and realize that civil society, we do, let us not rely on government only. Okay. Let us take the future into our hands. Thank you, David. Make it, wants I, to I, 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 I cannot agree more with what David said. I mean, we are in a completely different uh, time zone today. And, and I, I have been not been talking, I've been screaming 
that we should have this national discussion, what we are going to do with our oil wealth. And, and I feel that the, at least the business society and the unions are far enough now to say, yes, let's start this discussion. Okay. I hope that also the politicians dare, because it is something to dare that they will start a discussion on what we will do and how we will make our own future, because it is now the time to do it. Otherwise, we will be exactly what we've done a hundred years ago. Everything will be there by default. We have the time, we have the opportunity, we have the knowledge, we have everything to do it. Shada, and it is now, I can keep screaming and David can keep screaming, but you should also scream. I, and maybe I think we've been screaming. We've been 100 screaming. or 250 people that are listening also scream. We but will. we should scream that we should have a discussion and we should understand that if we don't do it now, we will miss the opportunity. Thank you, thank you, Rudolf. We've been screaming, but perhaps not loud enough. But I'm wondering, uh, Nicholas, um, I'm not familiar with with how the how the, the the sense is in in Guyanese society in terms of the discussion that we're 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 talking about in Suriname. Is there a sense of urgency to get everybody on board, a civil society, private sector, uh, to demand this discussion? I, what I see to me, I, I think that in Suriname, you are galvanizing your support. In Guyana, where we are is we'd had several models in place. And we are now at a place where we are arguing which model is the better model. I, so I, I, I'm proud of that we have done that. And our business sector and civil society have been very strong galvanized voices and they've had access to all of the politicians as well as the media. So we have pressed our, our case, so to speak. Uh, and added to that was the beautiful fact that when we started oil production, our first lift of 1 million barrels was done for 50 million US at $50 per barrel. Our second lift was done at $35 million per barrel, right? So it was what a beautiful way to enter into oil production that the price swung so, you know, so drastically from the first lift to the second lift. It taught us that oil is a very unique commodity in terms of how the price swings. So therefore you must, must have your policies in place and be very disciplined with how you're gonna execute those policies which involve spending. Yeah, if, if we had some more time and this was a, a more forgiving uh, a way of interacting, I would ask somebody from the audience, from the civil society in Guyana, I would ask them if they agree with your, uh, with, with the way you, you describe it. But we're not live and uh, I know that there are some people uh, uh, like Wanda, uh, I think Wanda is watching and, and I was really wondering how they look at this, but um, let me just add, this is just the first of a couple of discussions, right, David? Let me, let me just add one thing, though, Shara, I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah. We have inverted positions. We're in Guyana. I think we have done a very good job in terms of trying to put together models and discussions on how to spend the funds coming in from offshore. Where our big gray area is, is that the population is not comfortable with the regulation of the issuance of blocks, the management of blocks and model contracts for production sharing. Mm -hmm. Suriname is far more advanced in that regards than we are. So it's kind of funny where, where you all are strong and very strong, we want to learn. Uh, where we are stronger, I think we've done a good job in terms of talking about structure of a sovereign wealth fund and spending priorities. Okay, good, good to know that that uh, is food for thought. Um, I see we, we have about 10, well, five minutes left. Uh, I want one last question and then I'll ask you all for your closing remarks. Um, well, but I, I don't know, it's, it's like 300 questions. 
uh, here. I saw one on CARICOM, uh, which I thought was interesting. Uh, do you think CARICOM and how can CARICOM play a key role in developing a sustainable economic in, in developing a sustainable economic growth for both Guyana and Suriname, as well for the Caribbean in light of all these oil and gas development? Is CARICOM managing uh, is CARICOM managing and doing this, taking into con this consideration its history? So it, it, this is a, hmm. So what about CARICOM people? The I, silence I, is deafening. I, I think I could be the most politically incorrect here. So I would say that, look, CARICOM has been an organization that a lot of people can accuse of resting on its laurels in terms of promoting within regional development, right? But I've seen very positive signs. Uh, Prime Minister Mia Mockley, uh, Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez have been regional leaders in it, who have been shaking the notion of CARICOM being this organization resting on its laurels. But certainly, uh, and, and to, to take a note of the discussion tonight, this is a Guyana's discussion, plural. Uh, we need to start first with bilateral arrangements and understanding because you, you know very soon I'm I'm gonna bet taking Rudolph's discussion about the golden lane, we may have to have discussion on shared production if we find wells that are immediately cross border. So the Guyanas need to first sit down and, and our two presidents, uh, your your president uh, is Excellency Santoki has been having discussions with our president, uh, Doctor or His Excellency Doctor Mohammed Irfan Ali, and so that is a good start. So first the bilateral relationships of our two Guyanas and then our regional relationships within CARICOM become important as well. Because certainly Trinidad is there offering technical expertise, service and investment capital because they want to invest in the two Guyanas. And then you have other CARICOM countries such as Barbados and Jamaica who are looking at the potential that we have. So I would say that CARICOM has a role to play. But first, we have to have we have to strengthen our bilateral relationships. Okay, good. Uh, I, I, I can I jump in there because I think I cannot agree more with Nicholas on that one. I think it is extremely important that Suriname and Guyana are looking for the strengths and the weaknesses that we have on all the sectors. And one of the things for sure that we have to work together on is to bring all the associated gas that they are now flaring, to bring that on shore somehow in order for us to prosper uh, and, and to bring some cheap energy into, into our countries. So yes, I, that's one of the key things. First, we have to work together and then we have to think about the CARICOM. I, I completely agree with the collaboration. Go ahead, David. Completely agree with the collaboration between Suriname and Guyana. I, I don't think there's any question about that. Um, you know, in 2020, the food import bill to the Caribbean, the net, the, the food import bill for 2020, I suppose, is expected to be around 10 billion US dollars. 10, 8 to 10 billion US dollars. The highest per capita polluter from sulfur and, and nitrous oxides in the world is Trinidad. Really? Because of their, their, their massive oil, or, or you know, uh, manufacturing industry around the oil sector. The two countries that are top of the list, you know, top, top, top five of the list in terms of freshwater resources per capita, and among the top 10 countries in the world, 10, 11 countries in the world in terms of forests per capita, Suriname and Guyana. Could you imagine if we come together as a region, as a regional market, not only for goods and services, but also for the, the new economy? What a powerful place this, this region could be. If only we come together. And CARICOM has such an incredible role to play if this could be embraced. Thank you, David. Um, I, I think that's a, a, a beautiful sentence. If only we can come together, 
um, on that note, I will now invite you all for a maximum one minute closing remark. And I'll start with uh, uh, Rudolf and then go to Nicholas and then I'll end with David. I'll just throw that around because it's easy for me. Rudolf. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity in order for us to understand better what the Guyanas feel about a green economy. And it is, of course, for me as a CEO of an oil company, a very particular place to be. But I'm very proud that you guys invited me to, to talk about my passion. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Nicholas, last thoughts? Well, thank you. So thank you, David. Thank you, Sharda. Thank you to the, the WWF Guyanas. It is it's definitely been an important conversation. I'm very excited to see how you continue the momentum. It, I think this dialogue it answers some of the questions in terms of people asking how do we start to foment thought, uh, be thought provoking in the persons uh, who are sitting watching, as well as those who are thinking about getting involved. You'll find the appropriate civil society organization or business organization is going to be welcoming you with open arms. Uh, Guyana and Suriname have to start with their bilateral discussions because we have a lot of shared challenges as we move forward to exploit this oil industry that is offshore of both of our countries. And we need as much help as we can get first with each other, then regionally, as well as with the rest of the world. And I think that we will a model. I think that we are, can actually change the paradigm and be world leading in terms of how you develop the oil industry and still maintain a, a semblance of a green economy. Yeah, David. Thanks, Sharda. Thanks for facilitating uh, the session. Um, I want to start off by recognizing uh, that WWF as a principle, um, we we take this principle from a global scale. That, that, that oil, fossil fuel, is, is best left in the ground because any extraction of oil is an, a further unit of carbon that is, uh, it comes up into, onto the surface. But we recognize the right of sovereign countries to make decisions uh, for their, 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 um, um, their, their development. So whether or not there is a compatibility between oil extraction, we start from that principle. And then we ask ourselves, how do we actually work with societies, with governments, with societies um, to ensure that we have, we don't look at an immediate future, what is immediate, but look for a much longer term future. And so I welcome this kind of dialogue. And um, uh, as, as they, uh, as, as, as we would like to do, um, We'd like to make this uh, feature not only built around um, these public events, but finding a way in which this could live beyond just um, this conversation. Too often, too often we have wonderful conversations um, either within our sound chambers or across sound chambers. And too often we even produce a nice report that comes out of it. Um, but very often not much else happens. But I'm really hoping that uh, with, the, um, with the number of participants we've had, uh, not only registered, but also participating this evening, um, we'll be able to take this uh, uh, much further, building forward better for the Guyanas. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, well, building, what, what was your last sentence? Building, going forward better, building better for the Guyanas. And uh, in closing, uh, just some closing remarks from me, um, and if, if I listen to you all, and I think we can all agree, there are actually some threats that were, the, some currents below the whole discussion today. Uh, maybe the words were not used, but the, uh, uh, what you all talked about, it all, it all, all boiled down to cer certain principles, like, um, you need a strong democracy in which people can discuss ideas and agree with each other in dialogue. You need to have the principles 
we need to adhere to the principles of good governance, including participation, transparency, accountability, if you want to have any go with a green economy. And um, at the end of the day, whatever we have in terms of revenues should be spent in ensuring that the human rights of everybody are ensured and that we work towards a more towards a just society. So you all talked a lot from your perspective. And of course, this is what I hear from my background. And in saying that, I have to acknowledge uh, at the end, um, something that my dear friend Wanda, of course said, she said, hey, what's going on here? Three captains of industry, all male, and poor Sharda trying, <laughs> Sharda in the midst of you all, but all jokes aside, this is one of the things is that if we, if we strive for these three things, we need democ a strong democracy with the participation of civil society and the private sector, et cetera. We need governance in order to fulfill human rights. Uh, we will also have to look uh, most definitely not only in terms of right to education, et cetera, rights of indigenous people, but also gender equality. And I just wanted to end on that note by thanking you all for a wonderful discussion. I want to thank the team that behind the scenes who've worked really very hard in introducing um, some of the panelists and myself into the intricacies of webinars, Kemp and Kempthorn and Dylan and Florentine and Enid, uh, Enid from, uh, from Stats Oli. Thank you all for a wonderful evening. And uh, I hope to see you all next time. Thank you, bye. We're still, um, we've got rid of the, of the, um, okay. Camp, uh, is.